Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and it's time for another batch of Deep Space Updates. I mean, it's high time. I'm kind of late on this one. It's been very, very busy. So yeah, let's get started with the launches. On October 8th, we had the launch of SpaceX uh, Falcon 9 carrying Galaxy 33 and 34 to geostationary orbit. This was a very cool launch for the photographers, uh, and it featured heavily in my video about rocket noise because uh, we had a couple of photographers get amazing photos of the booster basically flying up across the moon. And we could actually see uh, images showing like sound waves being generated from this. It was fantastic. Uh, there was also this fantastic footage that was taken from the landing barge out at sea looking back because this was a twilight launch. So we could actually see the launch from the coast and the booster ascending and coming down for the landing. It was fantastic. Uh, October 8th, we also had a Chinese launch, Long March 2D. It's carrying an advanced space-based solar observatory, ASOS, that what it was. Uh, the, it's in going into sun-synchronous orbit, and this is part of like a space solar weather network that they're building called Kwafu. I don't know much about it right now, but it's Chinese stuff. I never know much about that stuff, mostly because they don't tell me. 10th of October, uh, there was a Soyuz 2.1B with a frigate, uh, like upper stage, ferry stage, carrying a GLONASS, Global Navigation System Satellite from Plisetsk. That is their um, the launch facility in the north of Russia. So this is the fifth GLONASS K satellite. And again, this was a very nice looking launch because it launched at twilight and there's some great photos out there of that. 12th of October saw Japan launching an Epsilon. Now, you may remember I talked about their Epsilon earlier this year when I explained that early Japanese rockets launched at an angle because they didn't want guidance on the first stage. Well, the Epsilon is evolved from the Mu, Mu, which is itself evolved from these early Lambdas. So this, unfortunately, was a failure, right? So it was carrying eight small satellites into a polar orbit, but somewhere along the line, the second stage had a guidance failure, and after it burned out, it didn't hold orientation. So when the third stage lit and spun up, it just went off in the wrong direction. So I think it was 21 degrees off axis, and they activated the flight termination system. So yeah, the, those satellites were lost, and we'll find out more as to what actually happened in the future, no doubt. Uh, again, on the 12th, we had a Proton-M rocket. Haven't seen one of those launch in a while, but this was carrying Angosat-2. That is a geostationary communications satellite for Angola that is basically built by Russia. And this is a replacement for Angosat-1, which was launched you know, a few years ago, and it failed before it even reached geostationary orbit. Like, Angosat just seems to be one of these cursed projects that was originally supposed to launch on sea launch, but when that venture collapsed, it was then switched to an Angara. And of course, Angara took forever. So then it was switched back to a Zenit, which is a Ukrainian rocket. And this launched, I think, well after the, you know, the Russian annexation of Crimea. And it was the last time a Zenit rocket launched. And it launched from Baikonur. So yeah, Angosat now launching on a Soyuz. And I haven't heard that it's failed yet, but it's early days. Uh, also, again, on 12th of October, we had another uh, Long March 2C carrying a Huan Jing uh, 2 satellite to sun-synchronous orbit. This is apparently an environmental monitoring synthetic aperture radar satellite with 5 meter resolution. It's supposed to operate for China's Ministry of uh, Emergency Management and the Ministry of Ecology and Environment. 14th of October, a Long March 2D, carrying again three Yergan 36 reconnaissance satellites for the military, presumably another few members of this high cadence reconnaissance satellite network that China's building. 15th of October, there was a Falcon 9 carrying the Hotbird 13F satellite for EITELSAT uh, to geostationary orbit. So 13F launched, a 13G is going to launch in a couple of weeks' time. 13F had to be delayed uh, right until the end of the launch window. But, you know, it's a geostationary satellite. They actually can have fairly long launch windows since they're going to a point 
that is rotating with the Earth, and it doesn't matter if it rotates so, uh, too much. Uh, so yeah, this was also the 100th launch from Pad 40 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station for SpaceX. Uh, yeah, the Hawkbird satellites had actually been originally intended for Ariane 6, or later they thought they might fly on a Proton with International Launch Services. Obviously that never happened, but this year it was decided to fly them on a Falcon 9. On the 16th of October, Angara 1.2 launched. So that is the skinny version of the Angara without all the boosters attached. This was also from Plesetsk uh, into sun-synchronous orbit. The satellite is designated Cosmos 2560. And it's presumably an optical reconnaissance satellite. Uh, its official designation, well, it's EMKA number 3, which apparently means in its experimental small satellite. Um, so yeah, this is the single stick version of Angara with a single like, RD191 engine, and it's still considered a test launch. Uh, there was a, like a scrub the day before, but uh, then it did actually launch. Okay, uh, 20th of October, there was a Falcon 9 carrying another group of Starlink satellites, Group uh, 4-36. This was the 48th Falcon 9 launch this year, and that is a record for a single type of rocket launch vehicle um, you know, through history, basically. I, I mean, I'm going to say, sometimes trying to come up with these statistics and interesting facts for each launch, it feels like I'm a sports commentator trying to dig into those statistics to keep things interesting. 22nd of October, we had a Soyuz 2.1V. That is not a real Soyuz. It doesn't have the four boosters around the outside. This is a single stick launch vehicle and it uses the NK-33 engines, which were originally developed for the N-1 rocket. These are rockets that were built 50 years ago and they're used on the core for the Soyuz. So uh, this vehicle scrubbed three times and it did launch a pair of satellites eventually. That was uh, Cosmos 2561 and 2562. And you'll notice that's three launches from Plesetsk in the last few weeks with three different launch vehicles. You know, Russia is really uh, you know, finding whatever it can to launch by the looks of things. On the 22nd of October, we had LV-3, that is an Indian rocket that was previously known as the GSLV Mark III. That launched 36 satellites for OneWeb, putting OneWeb back into the Constellation launch game after a massive delay that resulted from being unable to launch on Soyuz. Uh, this was also the first time a commercial payload was launched by on a GSLV rocket. And it's also the heaviest payload that was ever launched by ISRO. Uh, on the 22nd of October, again, we had a Soyuz 2.1V from v B, sorry, from Vostoshny, right out in the east of the country. That was three Gonets M communication satellites and a Skiff D. So Gonets is like a an LEO constellation that is similar to Iridium but a lot older. You know, they provide something like 76.8 kilobits downlink and 9.6 kilobit uplink. Now, Skiff D is a new test satellite, which is going to have like broadband capabilities. But more interestingly, this Soyuz was not fueled by, or by the Russian version of kerosene. It was fueled by what they call naphthil. And it's not exactly clear what that is. There's a lot of, you know... <laughs> The chemistry people will tell you that it's like a specific group, but uh, anyway, they're now using this instead of kerosene because apparently they have issues with being able to refine sufficiently pure kerosene, and this is a, an alternative option. It didn't, so Soyuz in the past did actually fly with a synthetic version of kerosene called Sintin, which provided a performance boost, and they used it until basically the plant that made it had to shut down and went bankrupt. Um, it doesn't seem to be the case here that they're getting better performance. This is just replacing some other part of their fuel chain with something that is perhaps more resilient. And finally, like literally hours ago, the Progress MS-21 launched to the International Space Station. Right now, I think it's still performing a rendezvous. Probably by the time I finish editing this and upload it, then it'll be docked to the International Space Station and they will start unloading those supplies. So that is the launches. And now we're on to the actual news, the deep space updates. 
uh, Ariane 6 was supposed to have launched this year. It's still waiting to get its first launch. And so European Space Agency has moved a couple of launches onto the Falcon 9. So these are HERA, which is the asteroid mission, which will go to uh, Dimorphos and investigate the mess that was left by DART. The other one is uh, EarthCare, which will launch on a Vega C in 2024. There is a third mission called Euclid, which is going to be a space telescope that will sit at the L2 point and it will study like dark energy and dark matter. And right now they haven't selected a launch vehicle for it, but apparently the Falcon 9 is a leading candidate for this launch vehicle. Uh, Starlink is now taking orders for private jets. If you happen to have a private jet, you can pay a ridiculous amount of money and get proper broadband on your plane should you desire it. Uh, also, by the way, Panasonic have signed on with OneWeb to provide uh, hardware for aircraft connectivity for you know with OneWeb. Panasonic apparently already a player in in-flight connectivity using GEO satellites, so this is a sort of natural evolution for them. Uh, Polaris Dawn, the space tourism mission uh, that's going to you know do an EVA. They have been posting a lot of photos and videos, uh, you know, taking certain YouTubers up for flights. And they uh, also sounds like they're, they have delayed things. They may delay it further next year. But yeah, that's uh, really interesting. They're just showing their various experiments that they're going to be flying. But meanwhile, the original OG, you know, space tourist Dennis Tito and his wife Akito are hoping to fly on a starship around the moon at some point. Now, this is going to be after the Dear Moon project. So... Hopefully they will have demonstrated this successfully. This is, you know, at some point in the future. So that, I don't know if they'll be bringing friends or they will be occupying an entire starship on their own or what their plan is. Meanwhile, if you can't afford, you know, billions of dollars to go on a space tourism mission around the moon, there's a company called Space Crystals, which launched an interesting proposition. They will put your DNA on the moon, right? What you can do is you can pay like a $5,000 deposit uh, for a 150, with the final fee being $150,000. What they're going to do is you'll get a DNA kit, you'll take samples of your stuff, of your DNA, and then they will grow crystals from it. They'll fly it to the International Space Station and grow like crystals with DNA, your DNA inside it. Then they'll return one of those crystals to you and the other one will go to the moon at some point and remain on the moon. So yeah, maybe some aliens find your DNA at some point in the future and clone you. And of course, it won't have any of your memories because DNA doesn't have that. Uh, that is a whole fascinating little story there. I've no idea if it's going to work, but it's way more realistic than a, a lot of these kind of wild uh, things that are sold for, for to uh, consumers. Okay, on the other side of the Atlantic from me, Cosmic Girl touched down in Britain. It has brought a rocket with it and it's aiming to make the first launch from British soil. Of course, it's not really British soil because they're actually launching it out over the Atlantic and it's an American plane carrying an American rocket that just happens to have a British person's company's name on it. All the same, it's kind of cool that they're actually doing this. I think they're still waiting for the launch license at this time, but they're more or less ready to go, I would imagine. But there's another UK-based rocket builder called Skyrora, who are going to have a high-profile launch to high altitudes, which didn't quite work. They were launching from Iceland, and the footage... Well, basically, they posted a video on their YouTube channel showing this nice two minute build up to the launch, showing how scenic the launch site was, showing how perfect their rocket was on the launch pad. And then they cut. And the only footage that has been released showed the rocket going up and immediately pitching over out of shot and going into the water very, very quickly. So not a success from Skyrora, but keep trying and maybe you'll be able to launch from Scotland sometime soon. Uh, SpaceX, by the way, they rolled out a Falcon Heavy to their launch site uh, in the, in Florida. So we're going to see a Flor uh, Falcon Heavy launch very soon, probably before I can make another one of these videos. Uh, yeah, and interestingly, or, well, I guess interesting, kind of 
known at this point that they're going to be expending the core on this Falcon 9, so Falcon Heavy. So previous Falcon Heavies, they brought the boosters back to land and then the core tried to land on a barge and, well, failed. Well, now they have the option, now they're going to expend the core booster and that makes a huge difference. You know, Falcon Heavy hasn't been as successful as taking launches away from Falcon 9, largely because Falcon 9 was developed much you know, beyond its original capabilities and Falcon Heavy just doesn't cover that many payloads. But if you really want to take advantage of Falcon Heavy, you really need to expend that core to get it going way faster and further and throwing that second stage way down range. So yeah, they're going to be uh, dropping that core. I don't actually know where the boosters are landing right now, but uh, yeah, it's going to be cool to see another Falcon Heavy fly. That's right. Um, NASA announced a list, a research team for their uh, Unidentified Aerial Phenomena project. This is a your cornucopia of experts from all sorts of fields and all around the world. You know, a lot of scientists and engineers known for their space science and remote sensing technology. There's some names you might know. Uh, there's Scott Kelly, of course, who was an astronaut. You might know the name Frank Drake, right? The person that invented the Drake equation. Well, he's not on the panel because he's dead, but his daughter, Nadia Drake, is, and she writes some amazing stories. Also, there's uh, Federica Bianca, who's a data scientist that works in astronomy, but she's also a boxer, right? So she'll be no showing the, you know, if, if the aliens are involved, she'll perhaps know how to, you know, give them a good right hook. Um, October 16th, Lucy flew past the Earth getting a gravity assist to kick it further on its trajectory towards Jupiter. And as it did that, it was observed by people on the ground, but it also took this really cool photo showing the Earth and the Moon together. And you know, if you look at this photo and you don't know the Moon is there, you might miss it, but it is there. But the Moon, of course, is very, very dark compared to the Earth. Its albedo is very low. Uh, but yeah, it's there right on the edge of that image. Finally, perhaps the most important piece of news to me as someone that talks on the internet about rockets and people come and watch me. Yeah, Kerbal Space Program 2 has been officially announced to come out in early access in February of next year. And this has been a long time coming. I went up to talk to the developers in Seattle in 2019 and they were thinking that they would have a 2020 release. And I remember saying, well, winter 2020, you could really stretch that out. And yeah, it did get stretched out. It's now <laughs> three years later. And I totally understand why, because first, your Kerbal Space Program. For those of you who know me as just someone that talks about rockets, Kerbal Space Program was a video game that got me my core audience. And it's a game that lets you simulate stuff. And the great thing about Kerbal is that it does a pretty good job of simulating all sorts of things you can do in rocket science. And then it puts little green men inside them. So, you know, if you kill them, you're not quite so distraught. Kerbal Space Program, you know, was developed for 10 years and then the sequel began development. Well, began development even before that. But the thing is, so, so what, they're, what they're basically offering is early access in uh, February of next year. And it's going to be some parts of the game. It's going to have like the original Kerbal system. It's going to have but most of your parts. It's not going to have like science. It's not going to have a uh, multiplayer. It's not going to have interstellar capabilities. Uh, but what most importantly I think it's going to have is an updated core of the game because Kerbal was developed for 10 years and they kept on building on top of this core. Every now and then they would go in and refactor important parts. But it was always pretty janky. And that's fine. It was janky in a good way. It was janky in a way that we supported it and loved it and modded the heck out of it. We did amazing things with it. But at some point, modders can only go so far to cover up flaws in the underlying code. And that's what I hope to get first and foremost from a release of Kerbal Space Program 2 next year. Yeah, so it's going to be like a $50 release for people that want to get straight in on it. You know, nowadays if you want Kerbal, you just wait for a sale and you can get it at like 10 bucks or whatever. But um, it'll be PC only initially. There are, of course, apparently going to be, you know, console versions at some point in the future. But 
I think it will be a while because we have this roadmap and we don't know how long the roadmap is going to cover because there's a lot of features they have to add in it. As I said, fundamentally, if they just fix the core of Kerbal and, and keep everything else, then I am happy, right? It would be great. So I'm looking forward to this and uh, I'm looking forward to talking to you more about other science things because I've been really, really busy. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.